everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Come Together, a new joint initiative by uh, the European People's Party and its political foundation, the Wilbur Martin Center for European Studies. Uh, with this new series, we aim at uh, regularly bringing together a researcher or an expert from the Martin Center with uh, a political advisor or a politician from the EPP to discuss a topic of common interest for our entire political family. And today we will speak uh, about a very topical subject, the future of Europe. And for this, we have the pleasure to have with us two of the main experts our political family can offer on the matter. Uh, Paolo Rangel, who is vice president of the EPP and vice chair of the EPP group in the European Parliament, and Federico Reo, who is strategic coordinator and senior research officer at the Martin Center. So welcome to both of you and thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Yes, thank you. So, <laughs> so I, I would like to begin with uh, a, a question for, for both of our guests about the conference on the future of Europe, which just uh, uh, opened these works a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, unlike similar uh, previous experiences, so these conferences, uh, this conference has adopted uh, a mixed democratic model, combining elements of uh, representative and direct democracy. Uh, do you think that uh, this exercise could provide some useful input in order to uh, better involve our citizens in the EU decision-making uh, without, of course, uh, uh, compromising our model of uh, uh, representative democracy? And, and more broadly, uh, what is uh, what do you think is the future of the EU democratic model? Uh, maybe, Vice President, if you would like to start? Yes, uh, let me say that uh, I, I uh, want to uh, uh, use, or I think it's not... Uh, uh, appropriate or adequate to say direct democracy in this case. So what we have is a participation mechanism, so a consultation mechanism. Uh, one of the big risks of our uh, democracies today is really the risk of direct democracy. Uh, as you know, if you read all the big uh, philosophers, uh, especially in ancient Greece, but then uh, uh, they were followed by uh, 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 much more uh, philosophers uh, of politics uh, uh, all across the centuries is that direct democracy is the direct way to dictatorship. And so what we uh, really see today is that we need to engage citizens. Citizens are a bit uh, far from the uh, European Union and I would say in every country far from politics. It's not only a problem of the European Union, naturally in the European Union, it has uh, a, a special uh, uh, weight uh, and a different weight because Brussels, Strasbourg, Luxembourg are uh, uh, more distant uh, from the citizens than uh, 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 other, other uh, capitals, the capitals of the countries. This is true. So we need to reconnect citizens with the European Union. We need to close uh, to have a closer uh, relationship, but in my view, this exercise where we have uh, uh, citizens that are chosen uh, uh, with some uh, criteria of also representation, uh, even if it is not uh, uh, elected representation, but of, of the diversity of the society, and then uh, national parliamentarians, uh, members of governments, members of European Parliament, uh, 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 commission and so on. This is an exercise for consultation. And, and so I didn't use the word direct democracy. This is to get closer the representatives that are elected to the people. And, and so it is probably a deliberative exercise to use a concept of uh, American political science, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, not really uh, uh, to replace or to substitute uh, the representative democracy. The truth is that at the end of the conference, the conclusions will be, uh, I'd say, uh, presented to the different institutions in order to see what can we do with them. Probably they will recommend some legislative reforms, 
some institutional uh, transformations, some uh, uh, even some change of the treaties. This can happen, but this is not made by the conference. The conference will be a kind of impulse initiative to reflect upon these conclusions, but not really, not really to replace the uh, the the role of the democratic representative institutions, that means uh, European Parliament and naturally national parliaments. Thank you very much. And, and, and Federico, what do, do you think? As Italian, you have uh, a direct experience about uh, this kind of subject, right? Yes, exactly. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, with the uh, vice president, with the vice president that um, direct democracy poses very grave risks of plebiscitary historically uh, sliding towards towards tyranny. And um, so, as you say, in Italy, we have had recently a very prominent example of those risks in the practice of direct democracy of the five star movements, which is now transforming and admitting basically that its own idea of direct democracy could not work out. Uh, I, I do think, however, that uh, it is interesting, this, this openness to participatory deliberative form of democracy for the first time, I think, in, in European integration is interesting and it is a sign that the European institutions are also um, opening up to new trends, to the new transformations in the structures of democratic representation, which we see worldwide. It is a fact, I think, that um, traditional forms of democratic representations are maybe, if not in a crisis, certainly in a process of transformation. Some of these experiments that we mentioned, or whether distorted, um, were a sign of this uh, crisis and of this need to uh, to invent, you know, different forms of democratic representation. And the reason is simple: that I think uh, very individualized societies in which there are very weak intermediate bodies and very uh, weak ideological also narratives. Uh, cannot be fully represented, you know, in the traditional ways. Therefore, I think it is a positive step that we are experimenting also with forms of participatory, um, sort of deliberative, almost in some ways, democracy um, at the European level. As to the, your, the second part of your question, which is the, the future democratic model of the EU, well, my views, I have stated them some, somewhere else. Uh, I, I tend to define the EU as a democratic federal union. Democratic, not democratic, and the, the, the difference is important. Um, federal union means that I think the union should move, and hopefully this, this uh, conference on the future of Europe will help the union move towards a solid bicameral system, you know, with a chamber of states, which is the council of the EU, and the chamber of citizens, fully empowered chamber of citizens, which is the parliament of the EU. And there, there is some work to do, for example, in terms of right of initiative to the parliament. We don't have that. Uh, we can envisage, I think, uh, it would be positive, a direct election uh, of the president of the commission through the Spitzenkandidaten process, potentially, or through other means. Uh, and the democratic component um, means, you know, the, democracy is a term that is more and more used in the academic debate on the EU. And it is defined normally as a union of peoples who govern together, but not as one, meaning a union of peoples who has no vocation to becoming a demos and therefore a fully consolidated single pe uh, people and who retain also in their democratic structures elements of internal pluralism. What does this mean? It means that for, for this federal union to work, the democratic structures of the EU had to be very well rooted in the uh, democratic systems of the, of the member states as well, that we should, in my opinion, valorize also uh, uh, national, you know, parliamentary democracies in their ability to hold European institutions to account. This could mean, for example, uh, strengthening, you know, the, the yellow card procedure that involves European uh, national parliaments, or even potentially strengthening COSAC, which is the, the, the committee, you know, um, the, the conference of the um, parliamentary uh, committees at the national level dealing with EU affairs, and also being open to elements of deliberative and participatory democracy more and more, uh, citizens' initiatives and so on. So I think the, the, a combination of these two dimensions, you know, a, a, a federal union interpreted through democratic lenses and rooted in the national democratic debates and spheres, uh, probably is the best model for the future. 
mm-hmm. in my opinion. I don't know what the <laughs> vice the vice president might have uh, a different view, but. And by by the way, I suggest our viewers to check uh, the the episode of your of your podcast, so you know about loud that deals uh, with that. It's a bit dated, but it's still very topical. Um, so as I said at the beginning, you're both experts about the the, the, the subject you're currently working on the on question about the future of Europe, and I think there is a common thread that runs through both the paper on the future of Europe that uh, the the EPP group is working on and uh, uh, yours and Martin Center long standing uh, work on a new Europeanism, and that is subsidiarity, which we know is a core principle for uh, for our political family. So uh, again, uh, Vice President Angel, what do you think is so how would you define exactly subsidiarity? Because sometimes it's a concept that is, is a bit misunderstood. And what should its role be for the future of the EU? Yeah, let me say first, uh, and the, the things are related with your question, that I cannot agree more with the idea of a two-chamber system. Uh, uh, I'm a federalist, but unfortunately, the word federalist is 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 really misunderstood today because. Uh, uh, in a certain way, it protects much more the uh, small and uh, medium-sized states uh, that normally claim that they are not heard. They would be much more protected with a federal system that normally they fear than with the current system, where the influence of the big states is much uh, greater because there are no clear rules of separation of what is competence of the union, what is competence of the states. There is not uh, clauses to protect. And so I, I, I'm clearly a federalist, but not in the uh, way, for instance, when people say transnationalists, this is not federalism. There is no federation with a, a single constituency across the federation. This doesn't exist. Not even in the states, the election of the president. Uh, the reason why four times in history, it was elected a president that was not the one that had more votes is because the electoral college, the 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 the, the college to to or have a college in the United States to elect the president is organized in a federal way, and so uh, this uh, uh, this is a very important thing, and I fully agree. And by the way, this was a discussion that is still open in uh, EPP group because I would say that the vast majority would like to have a two-chamber system. Uh, that means that we would have uh, the Council of European Union would be the, 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 the chamber of the states. That, by the way, should be called council because in the tradition of federalism, you have this council federalists and the Senate federalists. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the German tradition is the council. Uh, tradition where are the governments of the states that are represented and not really uh, the parliament or direct election election so we could live with that perfectly uh, uh, it's totally suitable then this would pose a huge problem where there are very divisive opinions that is what would, should be the role of the european council <laughs> this would be the next uh, issue because uh, should it be merged with the the the, the, the second chamber, or should it be an institution uh, apart, or should it disappear with a direct election of, of a president uh, of the union that could be president of the commission also, and things like this. Okay, uh, but only to say that the trend, in my view, is very much the one that uh, Federico has uh, uh, presented. Then we can, in some details, uh, have uh, some differences, but uh, uh, this would be, in my opinion, uh, the best future for Europe, even if I think we are not so close to that as I would like. And this has to do with subsidiarity. Why? Because I also have this discussion uh, frequently uh, within the group and uh, in the outside world, if I may say so, that is subsidiarity is always understood by uh, almost everybody as uh, uh, devolving the powers and competences to the local level or to the national level. Uh, and so that means that all the decisions that can be taken in a, a, a more closer level, a level that is near the citizens, uh, that, that would be the best. But subsidiarity is not that. Subsidiarity is to give to the right level the competences that this level can uh, exercise 
in a better way. It's what we could call in a kind of uh, Anglo-Latin expression, the territorial, territorial optimum. That means uh, if Europe is more effective in one field of policy, this competence should be a competence of the European Union. And this is subsidiarity. So subsidiarity can mean that you are going to give more competences to the Union and less competence to the member states or to the local authorities. And the other way around. So subsidiarity is a neutral principle, is a principle of efficiency uh, uh, and in a certain way, I, I agree, of devolution, but of devolution to the right constituency, to the right level of government. And, and, and that could mean the European level instead of national or local or regional level. So uh, uh, only to say we believe in subsidiarity in EPP uh, group and EPP party. This becomes from uh, 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 the philosophy, I say, even of the Christian uh, and democristian tradition, because this comes uh, from the times, I say, even of St. Thomas uh, and others, so we can affiliate the principle in a, a long tradition of reflection of Christian philosophers. And uh, by the way, in a certain way, what is surprising, even the Catholic Church is organized in this, in this way, even if people think that it's very centralistic in the Pope, uh, in reality, that is not the case. Uh, uh, but subsidiarity means exactly that. Uh, we, that could mean in a redistribution of powers in the future, more competence to the union, more competence to the regional level, some competence that are in the union could be transferred to the national states, but at the same time, some competences that are now in the national states could be moved to the uh, European Union level. And so that's what we have to be very aware of. Subsidiarity means mm -hmm. Uh, 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 the territorial optimum and not necessarily to devolve all the powers and competencies to uh, the parochies or small villages. And Federico, do you have something to add? And I know it's also something that is at the center of all your reflection on the new Europeanism. Yes, well, it's not it's not easy to add because, uh, well, the, the vice president has said it all. Already said it all? And I and I entirely agree, basically, with everything. Uh, well, I I call myself a federalist, but precisely because uh, the term is uh, is acquired in in the European jargon such a centralist uh, meaning and connotation very often. I have I have tried it over the last few years to to speak about true or authentic uh, federalism, which is anti-centralist in spirit, and it is based. Uh, on the principle of subsidiarity along the lines of what uh, the vice president was saying. Uh, of course, uh, uh, indeed, there is a reason why we feel like that, because as, as the vice president was also saying, uh, maybe subsidiarity is the most Christian democratic of EU values because it comes directly from our tradition. It is defined for the first time in, a, in a papal encyclicals in the 1930s, although it has a much more ancient um, pedigree, of course. I, I do think that there is more work to be done there. Uh, the, the way the principle is defined in Article 5, and it has been applied, especially in practice, I think, uh, over the last couple of decades, it has become rather legalistic and bureaucratic and ineffective, although it is, uh, it is justiciable in principle, meaning that the European Court of Justice can, can, could um, pronounce on that. The, the court has refused you know, to, to, to really have a Subsidi exercise a subsidiarity control on EU acts. Um, and, and, and as a consequence, I think the spirit of the principle is, has been a, a little bit lost. I would say that it is the lifeblood of, the, of a democratic society that is structured from the bottom up, um, organically, starting from the inviolable rights of the individual whose rights should not be taken away from the, from the community, first of all, and then also um, uh, insisting on the prerogatives of the lower community and, and, and the need for the higher community only to intervene in a subsidiary way. Uh, subsidium means help in Latin. So it, it is about helping the lower community and the individual to fully realize themselves, to fully realize their potential. In a way, it is about authority 
always being at the service of the of the lower entities and of the individual itself. Now, what does that what what is the potential that this holds for the future of Europe? You are right to say that in a way, in in the, the Martin Center work on on the future of Europe is can be seen as a call for returning to a rigorous interpretation and application of the principle of subsidiarity in uh, in the practice of European integration. Um, and why is this important? First of all, because again, as the vice president sort of hinted, it has the potential to clarify one of the biggest issues, I think, institutionally of uh, European integration now, which is the confusion of competencies, the very complicated allocation of competencies between the, the national level and, um, and the European level and the sub-national levels. Uh, this was one of the problems, we, we should not forget it, that the constitutional process was already supposed to solve, but it was left open, you know, in the in the Lisbon Treaty. So I think there is work to be done there. And also because if you think about that, I mean, if we stop and think for a moment, all the crises, all the big crises of the last 12, 13 years, in a way, can be interpreted as failures to correctly apply the principle of subsidiarity. So a union which was unable to act on areas where it should have been empowered based on the principle of subsidiarity, take foreign policy, take defense, take the control of border, take uh, banking union, banking supervision, which was important in the, in the run up to, to the euro crisis. And on the other hand, you know, a union that uh, is perceived as too intrusive, too threatening uh, by uh, the, at the national level. So I think that a serious reflection on the principle of subsidiarity holds the potential to solving most of the crises that we have experienced over the last uh, 10, 12, uh, 13 years. Think about migration, you know, the, the, the powerlessness of the union on, on migration. Um, and also to, to rethink the union bottom up in a way that places citizens more at the core of it. And I go back to what I was saying at the beginning, the idea of a democracy that is a, a democratic structure that is that accepts the internal pluralism of the union and that opens up, you know, opens up national democracies to each other, not only integrate at the European level. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we're a bit running out of time, so I would like just to ask you one last question, but really very, very in a short sentence. Um, if uh, when speaking about the future of Europe, what do you think sets the EPP apart from other political forces? Vice President, again, let's start with you. But really, well, in one I, sentence. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, what, uh, in, uh, in the process, uh, I'd say, in, in the uh, practical process, uh, more than uh, theoretically, is the realism of EPP. So EPP, uh, even if we have uh, a huge ambition and a very, I'd say, uh, uh, good and uh, strong aspirations on the future of Europe, we are very aware that it's better to give some steps than to have a huge project that has no conditions to be uh, uh, approved and implemented in the future. And so uh, 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 my main, uh, I'd say, difference with my colleagues uh, that were preparing the conference was always that uh, they dream too much and that is the short way to uh, have no results at the end. And that would be, uh, for me, a, a bad, bad solution. And so we prefer to have our feet on the ground and our heart on head. And Federico, realism too, or you have another word? Well, yes, I think in practice it is bad, but since you know the practical aspects uh, has been uh, elucidated by the vice president, maybe let me let me do the little bit the more theoretical, I would say almost philosophical um, uh, side. And, and, and one, one thought only, the Christian democracy has historically seen itself as the center, the mitte, still in the German context, you still see that. Now, this is often meant to, uh, to mean um, moderate liberalism today, but it is not the, the, the deeper meaning of in which Christian democracy saw itself as the center historically. Christian democracy saw itself as a higher synthesis between the extreme positions of the other two camps, the right and the left. Take the economic constitution. Christian democracy is not in favor of an unbridled individualism in the way liberalism is, 
But at the same time, it is not in favor of collectivism in the way that socialism is. So it represents a third way based, as we know, on order liberalism and the social market economy. And on Europe, I think today, we see exactly the same polarization of extremes. On the one hand, you know, on our right, you have visions of Europe that are essentially nationalistic, you know, nationalist populist. And on the other hand, you have visions of Europe, liberal socialists, which tend to be, they are European, but they are very centralistic in spirit. And, and we got back to, to what I, we were saying before. The vision, I think, of the center-right is the vision of a third way, a superior synthesis, a federal union based on subsidiarity, which also have the potential to reconcile you know, Eurosceptics and Europhiles. So in this sense, I think the center-right is the pivotal element of the European political structure because it has this ability to connect the opposites and overcome them in a superior synthesis. This is what I would say. So in, in, another, a second so meaning if, to the, the, yes, Vice President? If, if I may, this is, this is another name for uh, realism. That yeah. is what is possible to achieve. Yeah. Right, right. And and also another way to say come together, right? Like uh, the name of this uh, new yes. series. So th thank you very much to both of you for for uh, for joining us, for answering uh, our question and also uh, for all the work that you are doing in the in the EPP, in the in the parliament and uh, in the Martin Center. And to all our viewers, thank you for tuning in to this first episode and uh, we will uh, soon see you soon with uh, another episode of uh, Come Together. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.